The seven reasons why I'm not a Roman Catholic, and the seven reasons why I'm not a Roman Catholic is that the Mass is absolutely unbiblical, uh, that Mary is attributed the attributes of God rather than the humanness that she has and that she needed a Savior, that the Roman Catholic Church trumps the Bible with their traditions. Uh, in fact, that's, remember the big square I gave, uh, which I'll show you again, that's, that's the danger. So much Roman Catholic doctrine is biblical, but the deadly part are the traditions and, and of course, the paganism that's entered in. The veneration of images, uh, the unbiblical attribution to sacraments of what only God can do, which is the, the bestowing of righteousness. The Roman church teaches that, that the church infuses which is like an IV bag dripping into us, righteousness to individuals through the sacraments. Purgatory, unbiblical, never mentioned in the Bible, antithetical to all doctrines of justification, and of course the paganism, which we'll see tonight. Now you've already seen this chart many times. Uh, Christ died on the cross, uh, God's word was written, the church was suffering, and uh, it, it was uh, kind of a mixed bag, uh, Constantine, legalized Christianity, so a lot of people wanted to go along with the bad wagon, and they joined the church, and the church began to be diluted and diluted, not diluted, diluted, but the, the gross error didn't really start until about the sixth century. The first real pope, there is a whole string, if you go to the Vatican, you can see all their names. Most of those men, if you'd have talked to them in their day, didn't know they were the pope. They were bishops of the church in Rome. Rome always had a bishop, a pastor. And uh, in fact, one of the pastors went out and met the, the barbarians when they came. And that's why they spared Rome. They, they sacked uh, and took over the Roman Empire, but they didn't destroy the church there because he came out in his white robes and talked to him and everything. But the first real pope was, he's called Gregory the First. And the first thing he did is he accommodated people that really had trouble either with their relatives who were pagans and didn't come to Christ or their own lives that were so uh, non-Christian. And so he invented a place of pur purging, purgation, purgatory. So purgatory is never in the Bible or the history of the church until the sixth century. That is the beginning of this terrible uh, move, and you can see it in the big chart, all the way down to the Assumption of the Virgin Mary and the infallibility of the Pope and um, the Immaculate Conception of Mary dogma, which all are 19th century and onward things. I mean, it just keeps getting worse. Uh, and if I would have kept this going, we get to this syncretism uh, where the current Pope uh, is uh, working on, and especially the prior one, Ratzinger, that became, uh, I don't know all their names, but Ratzinger, the prior pope was the head of all the doctrine in Tübingen and, and he is the most articulate and this new guy from Brazil is, is kind of charismatic but the former one was a doctrinaire and he began wooing back the Lutherans, the Orthodox, the Episcopalians, the broken off branches and they're in talks for reunification so that, that's what happened. Let me show you why it happened. And basically, let's go into the Bible. Let's start in Isaiah 14. I just want to put some um, kind of little posts around to survey what we're talking about. The first one is in Isaiah 14. And what it says in Isaiah 14 is, the real conflict is not the Antichrist, and it's not the tribulation, and it's not the Pope, and it's not you know, Constantine on the Milvian Bridge. It all starts much before that in Isaiah 14, 12. And this is the real problem. And see, that's why tonight I got an email. I got an email Friday about a meeting tonight. It's going on right now. And it's over at uh, Hackett or whatever the Roman Catholic school is called. And it was written to all of the, of the Christian churches of Kalamazoo. And Calvary was one of them. And it said, please come to sit with our Roman Catholic bishops. And I don't know who all they brought to Hackett. To, to meet with the Christian churches, to 
embrace our unity in the gospel. It's tonight at 6 o'clock. That is staggering to think. Do you know what they're doing? They're planning to have at Wings Stadium a huge service to get every Roman Catholic and every evangelical Christian can get packed into Wings Stadium and have a joint communion and say, we're all Christians, we all serve the same Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to have one united voice in Kalamazoo. How can you have a united voice if you don't even agree who a Christian is and what salvation is about? But that's what's going on right now. They're 51 minutes into their meeting. It started at 6. It's not about the Catholic Church. It's about this. Satan wants one thing. He wants to deceive people into thinking there's a broad road that leads to heaven. And, and all the churches are on it. That's why the Roman Catholic Church regularly has interfaith meetings in Assisi with Hindus, with Buddhists, with the Dalai Lama, with the Muslims, and with all the Protestant. They even bring in Oklahoma witch doctors, you know, medicine men from the, the tribal areas. They want one kind of voice of religion. It's not the Roman Catholic Church. They wouldn't be thinking of that. It's Satan. And what he said is, look at verse 12, how you are fallen from heaven. This is where Satan came from. O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down. Verse 13, for you have said in your heart, this is God telling Isaiah to write down where Satan came from. Satan was the highest created angel of all. He was the head of all God's creation until he said this in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Stars. Remember it says in Job, all the, the stars saying, that it's talking about the angels, the messengers of God. He's going to be above all the angels, the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. But look at the end of verse 14. This is a proof of inspiration. If man would have thought of this, if, if humans would have written the Bible, we would have said, Satan would say at the end of 14, I will be greater than the Most High. But Satan knows no one can be greater than the Most High. Because God is greater than the sum of everything he's made, and Satan knew he was made. He was a creature. He's not self-existent God. But all he wanted to do is to be like God. And when he thought that, the Lord says, verse 15, you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the grave, to the lowest parts of the pit, and on and on it goes. Uh, the same event is recorded parallel in Ezekiel 28, only it tells there. This is the inside thinking, the pride, this is the mechanics that he was the anointed cherub and reflecting back God's glory. That is parallel to Revelation 17. Now turn to the other end of your Bible, Revelation 17, because real quickly, you see the twin plan that Satan has always had from the beginning. Satan hooks people in the world one of two ways. He gets them away from God in Revelation 17 by religion. And all religions... God does not found or invent religion. God gives revelation. Religions are ways that people have invented under Satan's supervision. Remember what Paul said, all the idols of the nations are demons. Every Buddha is a demon. The Kabbalah in Mecca is a demon. That's why the more devout a Muslim gets, the more dangerous they get. Why? Because they're listening to the founder of Islam, who's the founder of every religion in the world. There's only one founder of religions, and he's the one who finally has a global religion in chapter 17. And, and here it is. Um, it, it's in verse 5. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints. That's the Old Testament. And the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. That's the New Testament. So 
what we see in 17 is how religion has always been opposed to Christianity and true followers of, of the true and living God. Religion. Religion starts with Cain, right back in the, the Garden of Eden's gates. As Cain didn't want to offer a blood sacrifice that God required, he wanted to offer his best produce. In other words, I'm going to give what I want. I, it's self-willed. It's self designed religion. Abel was willing by faith to just do what God said. And what did Cain do to Abel? You all know Sunday school stories, right? Killed him. That's the beginning of religion. Religion has always been opposed to the truth. Always. And so in 17, here is the global religion, but what's 18? What's the other? If Satan can't get you in, hooked in religion of any kind, whether it's you know, uh, witchcraft, or if it's tribal religion, or if it's atheistic religion, or if it's, you know, scientific religion, or just anything in between. What can he get you with? Chapter 18. And chapter 18 is verse 3. All nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and they've committed fornication with her. And the verse 3, the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance. This is Basically, chapter 18 is the end of materialism, the end of living for money, um, the end of, of this, this whole materialistic world. God ends, all, in chapter 18, all of the commerce. I mean, you can read it. It's the luxuries in verse 17, or verse 7. Verse 9, the luxuries. Everything, verse 14, your, your soul longed for. All the things that are rich and splendid are gone. So Satan has always led a global rebellion against God since his fall, and God in Revelation judges his rebellion of religion and materialism. That's basically a prophetic view of, of the conflict of the ages. So where did religion take on the form we see it today, especially the paganism of the Roman Catholic Church? Right at the Tower of Babel. That's only from Babel onward do we have idols. There are not idols prior to the Tower of Babel. And that is the beginning, it, the idolatry, the Babylonian mysteries and organized religion all starts at Babel. Now, how did it start? Well, uh, what, what we have is the Semiramis, this is a name you can look up in history, uh, who is known as the wife of chapter 10 of Genesis, Nimrod. And it says Nimrod built Babylon and Akkad and a lot of other great cities. And, but it doesn't mention his wife, but history fills in the details. She became, as he was Nimrod, this mighty conqueror and city and empire builder, kind of the beginning of what we see in the Assyrians and the Babylonians and, and all that. While he was militarily conquering, she became the religious person in charge of you know all those ziggurats and all that worship and the idolatry and basically she with her son Tammuz were worshipped as a divine mother and son now we're talking about Genesis 11 and religion around the world always has a common element pagan religions. They have a mother and a son. A mother, Ashtaroth, you hear about her in the Old Testament, and Baal. You've heard of Baal? You know the priests of Baal? You've heard of Ashtaroth? That's a mother and a son. Egypt, you've heard of Isis, mother, Horus, her son. Aphrodite, I mean there you go, you read any Greek mythology and uh, Roman, you know, writings, and eros, I mean, mother and son. Venus in the Roman world, and Cupid, there's Valentine's Day, right before our eyes. That's the son. Cupid is, the, you know, the fat little naked baby is Cupid. And Venus is the statue, the, the one when you go to the museum, you go like that. The mother-son. In all of these, it's a fertility immorality, 
pagan, but it's always mother-son. And so all the way through history, we have a mother-son among the Assyrians, the Phoenicians, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans. They all have this mother-son. And what was the original story? Just real quickly, with, uh, I mean, I'll give you a, a snapshot of, um, let's see, how do I get this? No, I don't want to go back. I want to go forward. I don't want to go that far. Come on, back up. There we go. I haven't done this in so long, I can't find, oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, Semiramis, Semiramis, the mother, has a son. He's out fighting. Semiramis. Uh, her son Tammuz is out hunting, like his dad, Nimrod. A wild boar attacks him, kills him, dismembers him, and mom feels bad, and she picks up all the pieces of Tammuz, and she puts him in a basket by the river for 40 days and mourns. And on the 40th day, he rises from the dead. What a story. Isn't that interesting? That is the backdrop. A form of that is in every one of these religions. If you read carefully the hieroglyphics in Egypt, Isis has a son who dies and becomes, through Osiris in the, the netherworld, comes back to life. A mother given back her son to hold. And, and it's a mother deity and a son deity, but the mother is the dominant and the son is the lesser. The same thing happens with Aphrodite. The same thing happens with Venus. Especially you find this in the Bible, uh, Old Testament, in all of the, when, when Jezebel imports her, her Baal worship from Phoenicia through Ahab, it is a mother-son sensual resurrection of Baal from the dead after 40 days. So that's just, I mean, the whole world is, is immersed in this. Now, what happens is, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, if we turn there, uh, tells us what Paul's warning was. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10. And basically, Paul said, watch out. 1 Corinthians 10, starting in verse 19. He says, and what am I saying? That an idol is anything, or whatever is offered to idols is anything? Rather, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I don't want you to have fellowship with the demons, verse 20. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. What was he talking about? Well, particularly, these Greek and Roman gods had temples. Aphrodite was the one that was on the hill above Corinth. This letter. The highest point of, of the whole plain that, that Corinth sits on is this gigantic acro this this mountain. And the top of it was crowned with a temple to Aphrodite. And the people were saying, oh, the Christians, they're saying those gods are nothing. And, and Paul says, no, they're not, they're not real. Those aren't people. There isn't an Aphrodite woman. There isn't an Eros son. There isn't a Venus and a Cupid. Those are all fairy tales. They're, they're mythology. What's behind them? Look at verse 20. The things the Gentiles sacrifice up there at the temple of Aphrodite or Venus, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. What he's saying is behind every religion, every false religion, every idol-worshiping religion, whether it's the new tribe they just discovered in the Amazon with the drones, and it's the Stone Age tribe they never knew was there, they have their religion, and they, have, they venerate their little images behind every image. It says right here, there is a demon. So lurking out there in religions are demons. So that's all I wanted to say. Now we have one form 
of idolatry from this Tammuz Semiramis thing that starts showing up by this term. Now let's go to Jeremiah 44. This is fascinating. And uh, the, the, I don't think most people realize uh, that these chapters, this is kind of in kind of the long book of the Old Testament. A lot of people don't make it through. But, but in Isaiah, or Jeremiah 44, look at verse 17. And it says, But we will certainly do whatever has gone out of your mouth to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven, to pour out drink offerings to her, as we have done, we and our fathers, the kings and our princes, on and on. But verse 18, since we stopped burning incense to the Queen of Heaven and pouring out our drink offerings, we have lacked everything and been consumed by the sword and the famine. Verse 19, Queen of Heaven, Queen of Heaven, Queen of Heaven. Then you go on to Ezekiel, and you find, and let's go over to Ezekiel 8, 13, so Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. We have this Queen of Heaven, and now Ezekiel 8 and verse 13, and he says, in turn, and look at the abominations my people are doing, Ezekiel 8, 13. They brought me to the door of the gate, and to my dismay, the women were sitting there weeping for, what does verse 14 say at the end? What does it say in your Bible? Oh. The Queen of Heaven is named as Tammuz. So now this Semiramis thing has morphed into Israel calling this, this Babylonian mystery religion the Queen of Heaven has a name, and it's all tied to this Babylonian worship. And God says it had infiltrated Israel. And what infiltrated Israel was the mother and the son. Only instead of it being Semiramis, who was the high priest of this whole thing, it became Tammuz and Baal. And they just made Baal the son. And they called Tammuz the Queen of Heaven. You say, oh, that's kind of interesting history. Okay, now let's fast forward to Roman Catholicism nearby, just south of us, in Mexico. This, this is directly, this is, you can read this in any history book. This is Mexican lore mythology. It is believed that Our Lady, that's code in the Roman Catholic Church for Mary, our Lady, used the Aztec nah, Nahuatl word Coatlaxupe, whatever, I can't pronounce it, which is pronounced Guadalupe, and sounds remarkably like the Spanish word Guadalupe. You've heard of Our Lady of Guadalupe? What is the big deal? Why do Roman Catholics revere that? Coa meaning serpent, Tla being the noun ending which can be interpreted the, while Zopiu means to crush or stamp out. So Our Lady of Guadalupe was calling herself the one who crushes the serpent. Now you've got into biblical territory. What does Genesis 3.15 say? That the promised seed of the woman, who is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one that was going to crush the head of the serpent, and the serpent was going to bruise his heel. What did paganism introduce to the church? That Our Lady, the Queen of Heaven, is the one that crushed the serpent. See, what has happened in the era of Romanism is that Semiramis and Tammuz came right in when Constantine in AD 313 legalized Christianity. There were a whole bunch of Semiramis, Tammuz people who had this whole mother-son and the son dying, and the mother mourning for him for 40 days. Have you ever wondered where this event in the Roman Catholic Church came from? Lent. What is Lent? Lent is, is 40 days of mourning. You know, it starts after Mardi Gras, right? Mardi Gras, Fat Tuesday. Uh, then you go into Ash Wednesday 
and you're into Lent for 40 days, which ends at what? Easter. Resurrection. The, the pagan 40-day mourning for the slain son by the wild boar percolated through Egyptian, Greek, Phoenician, and Roman, and Babylonian religion permeating the Roman Empire. And when Constantine couldn't beat the Christians, he had an entire empire of paganism, a church, the Roman church, the Pantheon, that collected every idol of every god and just had them on the shelf, and there was everybody was equal. And all Constantine did is put his cross in there and merged the pagans with their Lent, with all the Roman practices of burning candles and beads and vestments and mitres, wearing those head things. You ever wonder where you watch proceedings in Rome and you go, what, what are those headdress things? Where the heck, what chapter is that in, you know? It says women are to cover their heads. Where are this men wearing these pointy things? And how did the Pope get the, the name? You know what the Pope is called? Pontifex Maximus. Do you know what that means? Pontus, Pontus is a bridge. So he is the bridge building big one. That was the name of the priests of this whole Babylonian. They were called the bridge builders. They built the bridge from the gods to the people. And when Constantine legalized Christianity, all of the pagan practices from Fat Tuesday to Ash Wednesday to 40 days of mourning uh, culminating in the, the rebirth of the son that died from the mother that was to be worshipped, the mother's son, all of that got folded right into Roman Catholicism. Not overnight, but just slowly crept in. So basically, there's seven vital reasons why I'm not a Roman Catholic. If you examine the doctrine of salvation and compare it to what Romanism says, uh, salvation by Romanism and salvation by the scriptures, you would come up with seven reasons. Because what the early church did, so here's the cross of Christ in the early church, and this is a chronological view of what's happening. The first thing that the church bumped into was the Roman merging with the, the church Jesus Christ started, the Holy Catholic Universal Church. And they come up here, and as they round the corner, they get all this paganism, which is works-based. And then they, they move along until Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and the whole crowd and Huss and, and all. They have the Reformation, and so the truth keeps going, because remember, Romanism is 90-plus percent truth. Uh, we get a higher percentile, you know, 98 percent truth here, but they didn't get rid of all those traditions. Why do you think infant baptism perpetuates this day in the, in the Reformed churches? Because Luther didn't clean it out. Because Luther was a Roman Catholic monk. And he was so happy he got as much as he did, he didn't want to ruin everything. And so then we, we get down here and we have our traditions and now you see where we are uh, with the, the excesses even, both of the evangelical church with all the you know, health, wealth, and and prosperity stuff that fold into the renewal or charismatic church. But this is what we measure everything against, God's word. The mass is unbiblical. We don't need to talk about it. Mike Gendron will. Mary is given the attributes of God. Uh, she is prayed to like she can omnisciently hear and everything and omnipresently come and omnipotently help you. They take their traditions over the word of God there is the veneration as in Our Lady of Guadalupe. They don't worship them. They just venerate them and pray to them. There is the unbiblical dispensing of grace infused through the sacraments, which the Bible says is absolutely untrue. There is the false lie of purgatory that you can live like the devil, die, and have your relatives pray you into heaven as if they could do such a thing. And then there is the acceptance by the church of all these pagan customs and I won't even go through all the apparitions and Guadalupe stuff. 
and even proclaiming that this Pope Pius IX, or Pius as they like to say, proclaimed that Mary is the mediator between God and man. And what does it say in 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6? For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself. So Jesus offered himself once, the Mass is repeated. So that's, in a nutshell, how we got the paganism of Romanism through the merging of the church in 313 A.D. and the gradual bringing in of Lent and then of purgatory and then of the sacraments and then of transubstantiation in that long decline.